Good morning, everybody. Coming to you from downtown Nicosia, Cyprus on this very sunny Thursday morning. Let's get to some news stories. The first topic I want to talk about is kind of an update as to what's going on in uh, the steel factory in Mariupol, in Azovstal. And we actually have one of the commanders of the, uh, the NAZI Azov Regiment saying that they're ready to come out if certain conditions are met. And the conditions that were relayed via a video address are stating that the troops who are holed up in this steel factory are ready to leave the plant with the support of an unspecified third party. That's, that's a direct quote. The fighters, they want to keep their personal weapons as well, and they want to evacuate their wounded and fallen comrades. The person that issued this statement is uh, Svatoslav Palomar. And Palomar refused to surrender to Russian forces or troops of the Donetsk People's Republic or the DPR. Earlier in the day, we also had another video address, and this was re released by Sergei Volnya, who's a commander of Ukraine's 30, 36th Marines Brigade. And uh, he said that there are 500 wounded fighters at the facility, as well as hundreds of civilians. He said, quote, this is our appeal to the world. This may be our last appeal. We may have only a few days or hours left. We are asking to apply an extradition procedure to us and take us to the territory of a third state. Now, the Russian military has been trying to get these guys to surrender. They've issued their own terms. They're, they've been trying to get some sort of humanitarian corridor in this steel factory. And it's kind of odd to, to have a humanitarian corridor. I can see why you might say, okay, we want to we wanna evacuate the soldiers who are trapped in the steel factory via, via a surrender. But a uh, humanitarian corridor is interesting, and it may actually um, verify that there are some civilians there. Now, I've received various messages from, uh, from people in, uh, in Russia and Ukraine who say there are rumors, and I'm, I mean, it's anecdotal, what I'm passing on to everybody, so I can't confirm any of this, and that's why I kind of use the word rumors, but what I'm telling you is anecdotal, and that is the fact that the Azov uh, NAZI guys, what they did before they retreated into Azov style to make this final stand was that they did take uh, civilians into custody, and um, some of those civilians are still trapped there, and they're being held as hostages because these uh, NAZI guys know that their only way to survive is if they, if they hold these people captive. And um, one of the reasons that the Alensky regime is, is uh, not allowing them to surrender and not allowing them to lay their weapons down is because they prefer the Russians to uh, bomb the hell out of the Azov style so that they can then say that the Russians did indeed kill uh, civilians in this steel factory. In other words, use it once again for PR and media points. Now, once again, the fact that there are civilians there or the rumors that there are civilians there is something I cannot confirm, so I don't know. But um, I've just been getting some messages that this may indeed be the case. And the reason, another reason why the Alensky regime would prefer for uh, the Russians to bomb this facility is, and to wipe out everybody, is to use these people to garner PR and media points. Another reason why the Alensky regime would be fine to have these uh, these soldiers annihilated is obviously because they have a lot of uh, of information and secrets. We've uh, we've documented in many videos how the Alensky regime has tried to to evacuate whatever's hidden in the Azov style via helicopters, via boats, uh, via Macron calling Putin. Well. As the French election is now coming to, uh, to its last days, and come Sunday we'll know if Macron is, is going to remain in office, 
I would imagine that the, uh, the orders from NATO and from the collective West to the Alensky regime has been, okay, it looks like Macron is, is pretty soon going to be in the clear. And so whatever we're, we've been trying to evacuate or whoever we've been trying to evacuate, it's better to, uh, to go the Russians into just destroying the facility and annihilating any evidence of, uh, of NATO soldiers or certain materials in that plant, just annihilate everything so that there's no, uh, there's no traces left as to what we've been up to. And that may include French fighters, that may include, from what I understand, Polish, American, UK, um, Croatian, Turkish, I don't know. I've, I've heard from various countries. The Russian military of defense at one point said that they've intercepted communications with, uh, with languages from six different European countries being uh, spoken. So I don't know. Anyway, that's the update there. We do know that uh, the Russians... They are going into the steel factory. They're on the outskirts of the steel factory. They've moved in. What happens next? We still don't know. But uh, they want to cut them loose, the Alensky regime and the NATO commanders. And when I mean loose, they want to annihilate them because uh, there's no use for them anymore. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are civilians there, to be quite honest because it does seem like a tactic that the Alensky regime would use, especially in order to, to gain some media and PR points if, uh, if the Russians did, did decide to annihilate this factory. So that's what's going on with uh, the update with uh, Azovstal. Speaking about Zelensky, we had the uh, European Council president, a very unimpressive figure known as uh, Mr. Charles Michel, and he was in Kiev visiting Elensky. Now, of course, um, I believe that Michelle was not really visiting Kalens uh, uh, Kalensky. I was going to say Kalensky. Elensky. Um, we can add a K in front of Elensky. We can call him Kalensky. Just don't call him Zelensky. <laughs> and uh, anyway, I believe that Michelle didn't actually go to Kiev to visit Elensky. I believe that uh, Elensky was in Poland. Michelle went to Poland and then they traveled to Kiev together along with their press detail. They took their photos, they took their videos, and I'm sure they got on a train or an armored car or something back to Poland. Something along those lines. So that's what I think is going on. But who knows? Anyway, Michel, who's... Michel's kind of a... He's, a, he's very high up in the European Union. He, some would say he's, he's Ursula van der Leyen's equal, but he's just such an unimpressive uh, figure that... Uh, no one really knows about him, but uh, he did make his way to Kiev, and once again, he, uh, he said that Ukraine is going to be in the EU. I mean, he basically, he confirmed the reporting that I've been giving everybody over the past couple of weeks, and when I say this, everyone always comes to me in the comments, not everybody, some people, they tell me in the comments, no, Alex, it's going to take 10, 20 years for Ukraine to enter the EU and they have to go through this whole process. And I just come back and say, yes, under normal EU protocol, sure. But this, this is an ideological project for the European Union. And they want their virtue signaling brownie points. And they will do anything to keep this Ukraine project alive. And they will do anything to add legitimacy to their meddling and intervention in Ukraine, not to mention legitimacy to the suffering that EU citizens are about to undergo due to sanctions with regards to Ukraine. And what do I mean by that? I mean, when European Union citizens are going to be paying five, 10 times more for their, for their energy and for their gas, when there's going to be mass food shortages throughout the European Union, when uh, inflation is going to hit big time double digit numbers, it is in double digits, but, you know, I think they're fiddling with the numbers. But when it really gets there, you know, people are going to be super pissed off. And the European Union wants to make sure that when their citizens are very pissed off, they can come back and say, yeah, but we're going to undergo this pain for an EU member nation, which right now they cannot say. That's why they want the, the Ukraine in the EU so bad. 
because they want Mitsotaki, Sendrute, and all these people, all these uh, puppet leaders <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to go to their citizens and, uh, and they want them to say, look, we have to suffer for another member nation because right now uh, EU citizens could come out and say, why should I pay double the price for gas for a country that is not even, that is not even in the European Union and not even a part of NATO? Well, the EU wants to change that. That's why they're rushing, desperately rushing to get Ukraine into the European Union. And uh, this is what Michel said when he was visiting the, uh, the puppet leader, comedian, actor who wears high heels, Elensky. <laughs> Michel said, quote, usually it takes eight months for the commission to publish an opinion. We are in close contact on the substance. We will have the opinion of the commission by the end of June. He also added that uh, he feels a very strong support towards Ukraine's EU membership drive. Now, they're going to shoehorn Ukraine into, into, uh, e, into the EU if, if it takes all their, all, their, um, all their might, if it takes all their might and all their, all their BS gaslighting and all their lies and all their fiddling with protocols and with... Uh, the rule of, and with the standards and the rule of European law, whatever. But they're going to do everything they have to do to, uh, to get Ukraine into the European Union. Also keep in mind that getting Ukraine into the EU is going to, to also uh, help Elensky and, uh, and his, uh, his goal to keep this war going because a lot of people in Ukraine are going to, to support this. You know, a lot of the West Ukraine is going to be very, very happy because you know, they've always wanted into the EU. So they're going to, uh, it, it's going to improve and boost their morale as well. So there's a lot at stake with, uh, with regards to the Ukraine project for the EU and for the collective West and the Biden White House. And they're going to do everything in their power to, uh, to make sure that Ukraine gets into the EU. Now, a country that is not... Um, acting like a puppet and is not bowing down to the European Union or to the collective West is, uh, is Turkey. And they're playing a very neutral stance. They're, pro they're, they're taking a neutral line with regards to Ukraine, at, at least as neutral as they can play. And uh, recently, the Turkish foreign minister, Davot Zuglu, was giving an interview to CNN Turk. And uh, he explained that Turkey will remain neutral and uh, this is a very, very smart political position, geopolitical position for Turkey, because not only do they, do they benefit from keeping their relations open with Russia, but they also exert certain influence now on the West, on the collective West. In other words, you have Newland and all these Western officials flying to Ankara, flying to Istanbul, begging Turkey to, uh, to come to their side of things. And when they're begging Turkey, they're, they're giving Turkey all kinds of carrots. Yeah, they give Turkey sticks, but the Turks know that, that these guys are, uh, can't really do much to Turkey at this point in time. They can mess around with the lira, but they won't. They won't do it. But uh, other than that, they can't really do much to Turkey. And so Turkey is, is, is playing a very smart line. They're playing both sides of the fence, and they're keeping their options open with... Uh, with Russia, and they're going to benefit from that. God knows in the tourism uh, sector this summer, they're going to benefit big time from uh, keeping their airspace open to Russians and being friendly towards Russians. Anyway, Kavosoglu said that, uh, and I quote, there are countries within the EU that want the Ukraine war to continue. They see the continuation of the war as weakening Russia. They don't care much about the situation in Ukraine. Kavosoglu said that Turkey for its part, is uh, acting as a mediator and would like to find a diplomatic solution to this conflict. Turkey has, has decided not to join the U.S.-led sanctions against Russia because they are unilateral, unlike the binding sanctions decided at the U.N. Kavosoglu told CNN Turk. Just a very, very smart position from Turkey. Turkey also said that both sides can trust Turkey. And he said... Uh, during the negotiations that Ankara is, ask, is acting as a mediator. Quote, a country that both sides trust. 
whatever you, uh, whatever criticisms one may have about Turkey or the Erdogan government, one thing is for sure, they have a, a very professional, smart team of diplomats. That's for damn sure. And uh, one final story I want to talk about real quick is these reports that Germany and the Netherlands are going to start drilling for, uh, they're going to start searching for natural gas in uh, what, what has been deemed in the past an UNESCO World Heritage Site. So Germany and uh, a Dutch resource company may begin new offshore drilling for natural gas in the North Sea, according to a joint declaration on Wednesday. They said Russia's attack on Ukraine had prompted Berlin to reevaluate its energy security. The hitherto untapped gas field lies 20 kilometers, 12 miles west from Waden, and it is from Waden Sea, a UNESCO World Heritage Site near the Dutch island of Schermakenkog and the German islands of Borkum and under the seabed of both countries. Supposedly, there are 60 billion cubic meters of, uh, of gas in these, uh, these fields. And uh, the Germans and the, and the Dutch are... Um, yes? Yes. Yes. You're going to be on the video as well. Okay. One minute, I'm going to finish that out. Oh, okay, let me just say a goodbye to everybody. Okay. Okay, so the, uh, the point that I want to make here is that the, uh, the Germans and the Dutch are forgetting all about their, uh, their green energy policy. And now they're just going to start searching for natural gas. So can we just admit that this whole green energy thing that we've been going on about for the last 10, 20 years is just complete BS. And now that they need gas, well, they're going to start looking for gas at an UNESCO heritage site. So anyway, I'm going to wrap up the video there. Look for Alexander's videos. He's doing really, really good analysis on his video with regards to Russia and Ukraine. Look for uh, the Duran live shows. We're going to be doing a live show today as well, I believe, a short one. And go to the Duran.locals.com. And I think the last story about Germany and, the, and uh, the Netherlands, we can make it into a clown world because it is a clown world uh, story. The fact that they're now going to start looking for gas at what was once deemed an UNESCO heritage site. Anything to, uh, to stick it to Putin, I guess, even uh, busting apart the entire green energy, uh, green, the whole green thing, busting apart that myth. Anyway, that is the video, guys. Take care.